Okay. So, I, good afternoon to you all. I have been asked to remind you that were you to want to speak, if you indicate and then when you speaking, press your button on. When you've finished, press it. You, you know how it works. We've done this before, haven't we? <laughs> so, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Is it worth just quickly whizzing around the table because I think we've got some different officer faces. So if we have a quick introduction so everyone knows who's who and what's what, always a help. So I'm Councillor Alison Gwynn, I'm from Thameside Council and I chair this meeting. This way? Yes, uh, way. Councillor Abner Zak by Manchester City Council. And it allows you to practice your buttons. Yeah, Councillor Shia uh, from Manchester City Council. Alan Quinn from Natberry Council. Councillor Atiku Rahman, Oldham Council. Councillor Roy Trafa, Stockport Council. Dave Lancaster, Salford Council. Uh, Councillor Tom Bestford, Rochdale. Councillor Robin Greedo, Salford City Council. Michael Kelly, I'm Head of Engineering and the Waste and Resources Team. Uh, Michelle Whitfield at the GMCA, Head of Communications. Gwyn Williams, Deputy Monitoring Officer at the CA. Paul Morgan, Head of Commercial Services at the CA. I'm Justin Lomax, Head of Contract Services at GMCA. David Taylor, the Director of the Waste and Resources Team at GMCA. Fabulous. So we're now used to the buttons. Brilliantly done. We have some apologies from Councillors Susan Emmett, Helen Foster Grimes, Judith Lloyd, Alan Quinn, who interestingly sat there. Paul Lally and Yasmin Tor. I don't know if there's anyone else that we're aware of that isn't here. Does that make us call it? So, uh, thank you very much. We shall move on to item two, which is chair's announcement and urgent business. There is none that I know of or have of at this stage. Um, item three is declarations of interest. You will have a form with you that came with your agenda pack. Um, you know to fill that in and return it to the clerk. So one presumes if you had, you have done so at that stage. Item four is minutes of the previous meeting held on the 16th of January. Are we all content to move those? Yes? Uh, Nodding for me? Yeah. Yep, brilliant. Thank you very much. Item five is contracts update with Justin. Thank you, Chair. We could just get the uh, presentation onto the, uh, onto the screen. To revert to paper, my uh, my computer is frozen. So, um, excuse me a second. Okay, so to to begin with, the um, the contract uh, updates report for the period of April to November. In Part A, we report the whole of the year to date. So that includes April and May, which were the last two months of the interim runoff contract with Viridor Waste, and then from June onwards, the two contracts with Suez. Uh, running through to the point where we have the most verified figures, most recently verified figures, which was um, to November of 19. Um, you'll see from the uh, from the, um, the the presentation there, and obviously in the in the report, that the total risings are nearing 770,000 tonnes, um, with the recycling rate uh, approaching 47%, and a diversion rate there at 91.67. We have um, a year-on-year. -year comparison in there to show that overall the waste arisings are increased by about 1%. Um, however, the diversion rate has tracked that and gone up about 1% also, although the recycling rate at this moment in time is slightly below, about 0.1% behind, uh, but in tonnage terms that is higher, but obviously that's tracked with the increase in overall arisings. So on the HWRC sites, uh, performance overall for all 20 sites, this is, um, recycling rate is approaching 42% there which is roughly 2% behind the position it was in at this time last year. Uh, when we look at the seasonality, um, garden waste, green waste, um, around, this, around the uh, July time of last year, there was uh, significantly different weather conditions to what we've been having over this year. So we do feel that the, uh, the seasonality and the green waste figures will have affected that. Um, equally, if we look at the uh, diversion, you'll see there that there has been a significant increase in the uh, diversion away 
from landfill. Uh, that has obviously been down to the ability to be able to use the Runcorn facility and there is a significant growth on last year's position also because the Bolton TRF um, throughput has been has now returned to a, a level that means that we've seen an increase of over 10% in landfill diversion in that time. Um, figures we normally report at this point in the, uh, in the, in the uh, meeting is also the, the curbside recycling rejection rate and the, um, the level of upfront rejections, that's vehicles that were delivered but had material on them that was unable to be accepted. Um, there has been quite a significant drop in that figure of the, of the, of the MRF, at the MRF, uh, the Materials Recovery Facility. Um, 430 tonnes were rejected, which is still a significant amount, but that's about 35% down on the position that we had last year. The other end of the, of the uh, MRF processing facility, that is the, re the rejects that have gone through the machine and have come out as uh, well, unrecyclable materials. Um, it's about 18.6% there. Um, that's, that's a slight, very slight decrease, 0.1% on the position last year. So fairly much the same as it was the year before. Okay, so looking at the health and safety statistics there, you'll see in the reports... In, in, yeah. Yeah, I'll just look at the uh, table on 2.2. You've referred to some of the, uh, the difference being in relation to the green waste. But I think there seems to be a worrying trend if you look over the previous uh, two years. Uh, uh, in fact, two years ago, we had a slightly better figure than we had last year, and it was showing to date this year. And the figures seem to be so finely balanced that we don't seem to be making sufficient progress in order to offset any... Uh, uh, changes we may have in the weather, for I can say the green collection and so on. So I'm just wondering whether you see that as a problem, whether you are uh, looking at uh, ways that you can try and improve that position. And I think the other thing is, can you, is it possible to give us a position on the green waste? Can you tell us how much green waste was actually collected in the previous two years as against this year, so we can see how much difference it's actually made? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, what we're looking at there is um, over the last two years, there have been a number of variables, not least the, the position with the interim contracts and the procurement. Um, so measures that we will talk about later in this agenda will be on the HWRC improvement plans that will be brought about as a result of this new contract, not just for green waste, but across the board. Uh, there have been a number of factors, in, including seasonality, uh, but more importantly, the Suez contract has brought with it a number of, of, um, of measures and commitments that we'll, we will detail later on in the agenda, and that will take us through how they will implement new schemes on the sites, new regime on the sites as well, that will increase segregation of materials across the board, not, not singularly for the Greenway stream, but for all streams. I think Councillor Quinn just wanted to jump yeah, in as well. You mentioned rain. Um, I actually... <laughs> telephone the environment agency and said, can you give me the rainfall figures for where I live? He went, yeah, July last year. Rain days should be 11, actually 20. Rainfall, the average is 64 mil, 148. And I can go on to a similar picture through to now, but there's been low dry spell lasting longer than five days. So that's why we have been able to get out with our lawnmowers. So it's not just a bit of a... There's always a technical explanation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so moving to um, the health and safety report, the main, the main headline we're going to take from there. Uh, obviously, we report on, on all at the level of um, riddles um, from, from um, incidents to dangerous occurrences. Um, we reported on the, at the last committee meeting on the two events that happened before, that's what to date. Um, since then, there has been one more riddle in October. Um, that was a, a slip, trip, fall incident where somebody fell on some stairs in an office and uh, injured their, uh, they cracked a rib and uh, suffered some bruising and cuts from that and therefore were off work for a length of time that um, signified a, a RIDOR uh, report. Um, the lessons have been learned from that and, and, and using stairs and uh, being careful when uh, being, being mindful of, uh, of, of, of stairs is uh, something that's been uh, passed on from, from that for, for the company. Um, no other, other dangerous um, items were found in that. Um, 
the works updates. Uh, to take you over to um, Chichester Street in Rochdale first. Uh, this is the construction of the bio waste TLS. Um, as you can on the left, uh, the left photo there shows that the primary steel work is up, along with the um, the, the rail cladding. Um, the cladding work was delayed slightly because of the high winds that we experienced um, in uh, February. However, uh, it's about 30% of that is now in place and the programme is catching up with that time. Um, over on the right hand side showing you the, um, the fire main installation and uh, also to, um, the, um, the pile tops there are exposed there as well um, and showing that we are making good progress against the programme with uh, with the uh, works over at Chichester Street. Taking you to uh, Reliance Street in uh, Newton Heath, North Manchester. Um, from the top left, that is the original uh, Dano pulverization building, the two large drums that we use for the pulverization of material to prepare them for the old MBTAD plant has now been substantially demolished. Um, the the, um, the building itself is probably 50% demolished at this stage and the reception pits which is where you can see the blue containers now the reception pits have now been filled so that uh, demolishing demol demolition work can continue in that area um, the pipe bridge that went across from this building over the yard into the uh, the ad tanks has now been brought down as has the pulp building as you can see in the lower photo there that's that's seeing the that plant from the other side, the pulp building has now been demolished um, and the, and the um, equipment inside has been uh, dismantled. Um, I think that's all on the, on the works today. I'll pass that over to David. Thank you. So just moving on to the next section of the report. This is giving you an overview of the HWRC access restrictions which were brought in place in uh, February, at the 10th of February. So just looking at the first two weeks, what we'd looked at was um, a change in the approach to actually stop vans parking up outside and walking waste in. So that was one of the main focus, but still enabling genuine residents to walk up with waste if they wanted to, uh, be met at the gate, have their waste removed from them so that they could uh, avoid interacting with traffic on site. What we also did was put security out across uh, four sites and then have a mobile patrol who, that could be deployed um, as required. And Suez developed a, a WhatsApp group across all the sites, which then enabled them to move that additional patrol around very effectively. Now, one of the main focuses was Reliance Street in Manchester during the, the first period, because that site is the one which suffers significantly from trade waste abuse. You can see from the photo here Due to the nature of the site and the layout, when we get a number of vans in, they will be in that site for anywhere between half an hour to 45 minutes unloading. Nobody can get in, nobody can get out, members of the public can't then get to the, the uh, waste segregation areas. And the impact that's having is that that site recycling performance uh, prior to the introduction of the scheme was about 19%. So you can start to see that the, the issue that this is having. So, during the course of week one, working with Suez, they had uh, additional security on the gate there. What was also noted was that uh, we had vans who were approaching the site at speed, taking the turning into the site very wide, squeezing under the height barrier in an attempt to avoid the AMPR cameras. So what was then uh, put in place was the concrete barrier that you can see on the, the bottom right with the speed bump as a means of slowing the vehicles down so you could actually get them on the, the AMPR camera. Now, other things that were happening during that period, we had vans uh, parking up outside, using masking tape to obscure car, the, the registration, using lacquer to obscure registration, having a van park up and then offloading into a car and doing runs in and out of the site. So a number of measures were then put in place with the support of uh, Manchester uh, enforcement team. And where we moved to was having to put in place this drop down barrier that you can see on the, the left hand side. So what was happening was when the staff were challenging van drivers, they were continuing to creep forward in the vehicle to try and force the member of staff out of the way to actually get under the height barrier. Once they're under the barrier and in the site, 
it's really the, the emphasis is on making sure that we can try and manage how they deposit their waste once they get in there. So once they, this drop-down barrier was put in place, it's enabled the staff to stop vans before they get in, then have the discussion with them about whether they're carrying trade waste or household waste, and to turn them around and uh, send them away. Now that has had a significant effect on this site. The initial data that we're seeing for February is that the residual waste going through there has dropped by 50%. And the feedback from the staff on site and uh, all the HWRCs is overwhelmingly positive around the effect that this is having. They can actually get on with the job they should be doing, which is meeting and greeting and segregating waste, as opposed to challenging and tackling traders. So the model that we've got at Reliance Street will now start to be rolled out across the other sites um, because it is proving to be very effective. Now, just turning to the data side of things, I apologize, you won't be able to see that very easily from up there. Um, but when we've looked at the total number of vehicle visits for February this year compared to February last year, we've got a reduction of just under 84,000 vehicle visits within the month. So we will typically be receiving anywhere between 450 to 500,000 visits. That's reduced across all the sites by 84,000. In some part, that may be due to the weather in February, which hasn't been particularly kind uh, to anybody, but it definitely shows that this scheme is having an effect. And as things stand, um, at the beginning of this week, we had only had one van exceed the annual threshold of 18 limits, 18. So others have reached 15 or 16, and they've then, when challenged, have stopped. What we've also seen is an increase in trade waste takings at the sites over the course of the weekends. So it is looking like it is diverting traders out of the HWRCs into legitimate disposal. So from a complaints perspective, the data you can see here is all the way through to the end of February. And in total, formal written, written complaints are around about 30. So again, low. This is really testimony to the communications program that was put in in advance um, of the scheme coming in throughout uh, December and then leading through January, the trade waste information packs that have been put out. From an enforcement side of things, um, the staff are being encouraged to use body cams. They are actively doing that. That is then giving us a body of evidence around how people are behaving on site. And what Suez have also been doing is reporting any issues with abusive or threatening behaviour through to uh, the GMP um, live chat website. And what we have had is quite good interaction with GMP. They followed up with a number of individuals through home visits um, and informed them that if they turned up on site again, then they potentially would be arrested because of the way in which they are um, behaving on site and also the fact that they would be coming up to the thresholds there. So that, that's been uh, very helpful. We have had support from district enforcement teams and what we are looking at, which is discussed in the report, is the potential for a dedicated enforcement resource which potentially could work across the 20 sites um, throughout Greater Manchester. There needs to be a bit more work on that to develop it, but as a concept we're looking at that and would bring that back to the committee at a later date. So just around the, the data side of things, Suez are now looking at making this more user friendly. So they have ordered 20 uh, handheld devices for the sites, which links to the <coughs> AMPR system, and that will enable the site operatives to be able to check real time how many visits a vehicle has had, and also to be able to update the system um, the AMPR can't always detect whether it's a car or a van, whereas this system will enable them to actually update the system live, uh, real time, when they see a vehicle come into site. So that's going to make it a lot slicker and we'll be able to uh, interrogate that data a lot more quickly. So the next steps of this are, um, again, ongoing training uh, for the staff, looking at that new system using tablets. And then the report is also looking at uh, the potential to introduce a van permit scheme. Now, at the moment, we have always said that we didn't really support the concept of a permit scheme on a global basis because of the number of site visits that we were getting, half a million a month. From the data we've got, it shows that we're typically getting between 10 and 13,000 van visits per month, which is a much more 
easily manageable number to look at potentially introducing a permit scheme. So what we will do is go away, look at other schemes which are in existence elsewhere. Hertfordshire is um, an online system which potentially gives us a, a template that we could look at. And again, we will bring back proposals to a future meeting of the committee as we've got more data from the scheme over the course of the next uh, couple of months so that we can give you a, a reasoned proposition on that. So I'll stop there at that point. We're happy to take any questions on any part of the Part A contract type update report. OK, I've got Councillor Akbar and then Councillor Bestwood. OK, uh, thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you, David, for that, for that uh, comprehensive report. I actually visited Reliance Street in, in the opening couple of weeks. I think it was between uh, that period when we had uh, those couple of storms uh, so, so the weather wasn't too favourable, but absolutely shocked with the amount of volume of, of, of kind of traders that were coming in on, on, on a day that was really, uh, you know, you wouldn't even set foot out there. Uh, I, think, I think it's right. I think I'm, I should put on record, uh, I was there with our council officers, but I think the amount of uh, the work that the staff, the sewage staff do and, and, and how they, what they had to deal with was way and above beyond what, what, what they really paid for and, and, and what their duties actually said. So I think on record, I think our thanks should go to them. Because what I, I witnessed was some really aggressive behavior, uh, people who were kind of coming right up to your face when challenged. And just, just challenges, ask with simple questions, you know, where does that trade, where's that waste come from? You know, how many times have you been? Just simple questions, but it was really aggressive. And, and I saw the speeding as well. Uh, in terms of the security, I think nothing, nothing against them, but I felt it was, there was very little they could do. I mean, they could watch and maybe note, but I think if the, if the situations got worse, I think there was very difficult that they could do. So I'm glad GMP have been involved. I think GMP needed to be involved because some of them were, were nasty people. And, you know, I'm, I'm not mincing my words to say that. Uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you say that uh, clearly some of them are going, uh, your trade waste has gone up, uh, but, the amount of volume I saw on, 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 on a, such a kind of a, a bad day in terms of weather conditions, uh, how confident are we that some of that other waste, where is it going then? Because clearly all of them are, aren't suddenly going to start complying. And I can't imagine all 100% will have been converted to trade waste. Uh, and are, have we got any data to say where those vehicles were coming from? Was it within the Greater Manchester region? Was it outside? And where do we where do we think that 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 waste is is going now? Uh, because it, it it was it was it was a bit of an eye opener certainly from 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 my perspective. Okay, so as far as where the origin of the waste <coughs> is coming from, we don't have data on that. We're reliant upon the individuals giving you know, an answer, which is is correct. So as far as where the waste is going to, some of it is coming through our sites as trade waste. That's where we've got the data for. Some of it will be going to other commercial facilities. We have asked um, districts to inform us if there is any evidence of any increase in fly tipping. So that data is being looked at. Again, it's too early to have anything quantifiable at this point in time. What the Environment Agency are doing for us is they are checking their database to see if there's been any increase in applications for carriers registration um, to demonstrate that people are then legitimizing what they do. They are also looking at the um, fly tip database and they are also monitoring their known illegal waste sites across Greater Manchester to see if there's any increase in throughputs going through those. So I think we, we are only one month into the scheme, but all of that data is being collated and will be looked at. And again, we will feed that back to the committee. Um, thanks for that report. I absolutely echo what Councillor Akbar was saying about um, uh, about needing to combat uh, this, um, combat traders illegally dumping in the household facilities. Um, I'm just trying to get a handle on the scale of the problem. Um, and specifically, I wonder whether you'd be able to pull together some figures for the uh, uh, how big how big an impact this is in terms of in terms of money in terms of how much it costs the contract um, and also it would be helpful um, you mentioned that the potential to implement further schemes such as additional enforcement or a permit um, how much those costs would be so we so we can actually understand you know if we're introducing these schemes uh, how much of a saving is that and, and how big is the issue 
I can't give you answers to those questions now, but what we will do is uh, we will be having discussions with other local authorities like Hertfordshire. That will then tell us the administrative cost, give us an indication of what the benefit that they've taken from it, and then we will develop a proposal around that to bring back to the committee. So I've got Councillor Quinn and I've got Councillor Garrido. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. I mean, I, I visited the, the Lums, Lums Lane uh, site. Um, I was speaking to the lads there, and they said there has been some abuse. It's, but they mentioned Reliance Street, and it's not on the level of Reliance Street. But you know, from, from on one hand, this is a, this is a success story: eighty-six thousand fewer visits, and and the media, whether that's printed or you know social or radio or tele, they're always willing to have a go at the council. So I think we should be having a go back and saying this is actually saving the, the council taxpayers of Greater Manchester a lot of money. But I also feel what we should be saying is that what happens is if you're having, or if people are having a job done, say you're having an extension done, we're paying for that rubbish to be taken away to a trade site. And what a lot of these rogue builders are doing is they try to dump it at the household waste. You know, the clue is in the name, household waste. It's not for them to illegally dump their rubbish there. So I think what we should be doing is, is coming down as heavy as we can because it's a few, a few years since I served on, on, on the bench, but this is causing fear, fear, alarm and distress to our employees and we should be sending out the message that we're not going to tolerate that. And when people, I, I think we're also defensive about fly tipping sometimes. We hear that, well, if you do this, it'll increase fly tipping. It's a crime. You know, 90, 90 odd percent of our residents will, you know, they take it to the also waste recycling centre. They do the right thing. And we should be clamping, you know, fly tipping. It's a criminal offence. It's in a magistrate's cause, you know. But we should be doing whatever we can to support our staff. But also, if we do get the fly tippage, we should be hammering them because what they're doing is unlawful. So, thanks, Chair. Yeah, thank you, sir. I totally agree about the flight tipping. It's really down to the individual local authorities to obviously clamp down. I know uh, in Salford we're certainly uh, starting to do that. I'm sure other authorities are uh, as well. Uh, it's good news, I think, what you've actually been saying. You've actually been making some good progress there. So it's not really that I want to talk about, but you mentioned uh, something around about half a million visitors uh, to, was that one site or? Several sites. Across the <laughs> 20 across. sites yeah, yeah. per month, it's about half a million it, visits. It just strikes me that when we're in the business of obviously uh, saving money wherever we can, is there not an opportunity there uh, for sponsorship of some kind, for advertising on the sites, that type of thing? Uh, with that many people visiting, I'm sure it would be quite attractive to uh, to number of organisations. It isn't something we've, we've looked at um, before, so we'll take that point away and consider whether there is something we can do around signage and space. Mm. Councillor Lancaster, and then I've got uh, Councillor Ratan Rama. You actually mentioned in the report the amount of work, uh, building works you've been doing at each site. I know the capital works were already identified in the budget, but some of the modifications you refer to, how are they, is that compared to budget? Or how's it being paid for? Is there a specific example? You... Okay. No, the um, barriers Suez have put in at their own cost. So they, they are doing that. The additional um, body cameras have been at their own cost and the additional 20 tablets, um, handheld devices that they're acquiring are all at their own cost. Th thanks, Chair. Um, some of the points I want to make in terms of the, the, the staff have, have already um, been raised, so I won't, I won't repeat them. Uh, just one, uh, I actually visited uh, while uh, after the, 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 the February date, um, about three times because we were doing some um, spring cleaning uh, in Oldham on the Arkwright Street site. Uh, and to be fair, I, I didn't notice uh, any uh, sort of like, you know, um, any of this behaviour. So I was wondering whether certain sites have more problems um, than, than the others. Um, so I'd be interested to know how it's working out in, on, on the different sites. Um, there's only one question and I was on the phone some, to somebody on my way to this meeting um, and they wanted a clarification in terms of the 52 visits. Is it because every household has at least two cars, well, most of the households. So is it 
per household, or if you've got, for example, two vehicles, would that increase the number of visits to 104 or whatever? Thank you. So, first of all, um, on the sites, yes, the, the level of trade waste abuse varies across them. So what we did with Suez is identified four sites, um, Arkwright Street was actually one of them, where it tended to be historically higher levels of uh, abuse going on, and that's where we put the static security. And then we had the fifth security patrol, which would be deployed wherever it was required. So I think I was um, at Arkwright Street during the first week, and it was noticeably quieter than I've seen it previously. And I think what we'll, we'll, we will now see is, as we replicate what we've done at Reliance Street, at some of the other facilities, I think it will potentially move around the network of sites. So what Suez will be doing is, as fast as possible, is putting the same level of control in at every single site so that we can try and get consistency. So on the 52 visits, it is linked to the vehicle registration. So it is based on the vehicle. Council Driver. Just a, a quick one on, on the, uh, the trade waste. I mean, if, it, if this policy is effective, then hopefully most of the trade waste will go to commercial waste organisations. So that, that's good, because it's good for the commercial waste organisations. They're getting more business. Was it possible to pass the pro project so how we review that? So trying to identify whether it actually increased business with commercial trade waste companies, because that should show the success of its work by actually diverting people to using the legitimate commercial disposal facilities rather than fly tipping or whatever else they might do. I realise it might be difficult getting the information, but perhaps uh, that might help support our case. Well, what we will definitely have is the evidence from Suez where they've taken more trade waste over the waybridges, and that's quantifiable. The difficulty we will have is getting the same information from private sector operators the only route we can possibly might be able to do that is through the Environment Agency, uh, but I would need to discuss with them to see if they can access that information and share it with us. Okay, if that's us all done, if I can bring your attention to the recommendations, which is one, to note this report. Secondly, to support the principle of establishing dedicated HWRC enforcement resources and request further details to be provided at a further meeting, which we've already discussed. And three is to request further detailed proposals for a van permit scheme to be developed and presented to a further meeting. Okay, if we're all content with those, yep, yep, yep. we shall move on to item six, which is waste and resources communications and behavioural change update, which Michelle is taking us through. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to talk through the report and pick out some key items and then you'll notice you have a, a dashboard attached to the end of the report that just highlights some of the key activity that's happened between November and February. Um, so I'll just start out by talking about the uh, Section 3, Reduced Contamination. In last year, the main focus was on reducing contamination in the mixed recycling bin. So that was to encourage residents to recycle plastic bottles only and to put other types of plastics in their general waste bin. Um, so that campaign was called It's Got to Be a Bottle. Phase one involved targeting certain districts with leaflets and bin stickers. And then phase two is running at the moment where we've got outdoor advertising and uh, road shows going on at the moment with Hits Radio. And Hits Radio are running... Um, competitions on their radio station and online as well to support the campaign. Um, in uh, 3.4, it talks about the e-learning module. The e-learning is now available on all councils LMS system. So I would encourage you to encourage all of your council staff to take, the, uh, take, through, take some time to have a look at the module and um, actually complete it. One of our officers has been going round to some of the council buildings to raise awareness of the LMS system, so he's now completed events at Salford, Oldham and at the GMCA, and I believe that Manchester are about to launch their um, LMS system next week. Um, the focus on our uh, contamination uh, co uh, communications will focus on paper and card for the rest of this year. Um, mainly because of the problems in the paper and card market um, and the amount of uh, problems that we're having with uh, rejected loads. 
Um, and waste prevention, um, in May we'll be running, starting to run a, a national Love Food Hate Waste campaign so across Greater Manchester. Um, for the first time there's going to be a food waste prevention week which will be a big focus of the campaign and then we'll be doing some outdoor advertising and community events. Um, if I go down to section five, this focuses on the Recycle for Greater Manchester bin app, which is one of the um, recommendations, is to, um, because of some problems we're having with the actual app itself, uh, we'd like to end the contract with our current contractor. We've had lots of conversations with them about whether we can actually update the software, and it's just not possible. So um, it's actually causing us quite a lot of problems because it's not working properly, it's breaking regularly, and because it's quite an old system, it doesn't work on lots of new smartphones. Um, so what we're recommending is that we end the contract, um, which will mean we won't have a bin app for a period of time, but then what we want to do is work with the councils to develop a new bin app, which will have um, a postcode finder so that residents can look up when their bin is collected, but then we also want to talk to the local councils about other functions that that might have. So, for example, reporting fly tipping is one thing that... Um, we might be able to do. Um, when we put our com communications plan together for November last year, we talked to a couple of app developers about rough costs. Um, so to develop a, a council app for one individual council, it would be about eight, nine thousand pound. But if we got together all nine councils and just developed another app similar to the Recycle for Greater Manchester bin app, we're looking at around 50,000 pounds. So what we're proposing is that we um, do some communication to the current users, um, end the app, and then develop a new one in consultation with the council officers. Uh, section six talks about education, and it's, uh, there's a table there that shows the visitor centre numbers from September last year to February this year. As you can see, the busiest site by far is Longley Lane for both the school and community bookings. The um, energy facility at Hurstwood Court in Bolton has had fewer visitors since the fire. Um, however, we did start to run some um, visits at the Household Waste Recycling Centre, but we've had to stop them due to obvious reasons for health and safety. Um, so we're in discussion at the moment with Suez, who would like to rent some of the office space at Hurstwood Court. When it's not used for educational visits, the building is empty at the moment. Um, the, the actual Hurstwood Court building is right next door to the Energy Recovery Centre where the staff work, so it would be quite easy for them to have their offices there. Um, and it's also not part of the current contract, so it's a lease that we have separately on that building. So what that, that has led to is that um, I've been talking with our education team about what that would mean for future uh, education service. We don't have that many visits at the moment at Hurstwood Court. The actual exhibition centre is in real need of um, upgrading. It's not been touched for the last 10 years, so it really needs decorating. And a lot of the information on the boards are out of date. So it would need a considerable amount of money spending on actually updating the boards and decorating it. But then we also feel that actually offering residents a tour around an energy recovery centre isn't really the message that we want to go to. If you look at the way the contract is going with developing reuse shops, we want to develop more messages around waste prevention, repairing things, um, around reuse. So what we'd like to do is develop some more outreach. So we're actually going out to schools and community groups with a whole package of resources to talk about waste prevention and reuse rather than taking them around the energy recovery centre. And then what we're planning to do in the summer is to spend some money on upgrading Longley Lane and up upgrade the um, actual classroom itself with a bit more interactive um, activities for the children to do. Um, and then that would be our main centre. And then on top of that, we'd offer outreach to schools and community groups with a whole package around not only um, focusing on Longley Lane and the contamination issue, but also about waste prevention and reuse. Um, and I just want to pick up on um, the House of Waste Recycling Centre and the point that Councillor Quinn made. We are doing some um, PR and a press release about the reduction in the traffic from... I'm talking to Mike Nuttall, the comms manager at Suez, about putting together a piece about showing the success of the House of Waste Recycling Centre. Um, 
and that's, uh, that's the report. I'll answer any questions. Any questions, uh, Councillor Bessford? Thanks, Chair. Um, can you talk to us, Michelle, about why an app and why not just good mobile optimization of the website? Uh, who's using an app that's not using the website and what are the specific benefits of an app over mobile optimization of the web? Yeah, the, the main benefit of an app is everyone's got a mobile phone. Um, in order to get the data on the app, it's, on the app, it's much quicker than a, a website. Um, I think all councils have now got the postcode finder on their website, but in order to find it, you have to go through several steps to actually look up the information. On the app, it would be quite instant. You'd press a button and put your postcode in, and you'd find the information. The other benefit is targeting audience that... Um, our data shows that the audiences that tend to download the app are that group, sort of 18 to 34, that are a good target audience that we might not be reaching through other communication methods. Um, and the benefit of having our own app is that we can control it and push out lots of other information. So one example that someone has shown to me about an app that's in existence, um, I can't remember the name of the council down south, was that say your bin collections can't happen on particular streets because of bad weather, you can send a, a bespoke um, message to just people living in certain streets and certain postcode areas to say your bins won't be collected today because of the snow, for example. And what we're finding more and more in communications that people want more bespoke information just for them. So rather than doing blanket leaflets and newspaper adverts, the app gives us that extra benefit that that doesn't, so we can actually tailor the information. I mean, we've even started talking about could we look at if there's a particularly bad round that you've got that you know that loads are being rejected, can we just target that round with some... Um, because, it, because the phones have GPS on them, you can actually send specific messages to specific areas about, did you know that we've had to reject, you know, um, a number of bins in your areas because people have been putting general waste in there or nappies in there. You can kind of put bespoke messages together. So that's the benefit of it over using a website. I didn't know that all the other local authorities didn't have an app. Tameside's got an app and has had one probably 10, 15 years now. Uh, a long time, isn't it? Actually, yeah. yeah. And it's great. So my bin's emptied on a Wednesday. I get an alert at Tuesday tea time to remind me which bins are going out. And you can report risk bins and stuff on it. It's really good. And it, I would never, ever look at the website. I, and just the app just flashes it up. So it's really really simple and you know what's going out and there is so much more that it can, can do. Council Lancaster. Just a quick question. Looking at uh, item 9-1 and the budget, for one of the things which I'm obviously really interested in is the education programme which we've got because I think it's critical that we involve the schools more than we do. Has there been any evaluation to whether we some of the training or, or the presentations couldn't be done better at the school and get into more people rather than bringing them into the sites which we've got? Yeah, we are actually looking at our figures at the moment to see um, where our visitors are coming from. And we know that visitors to Longley Lane, for example, are mainly coming from Manchester, Stockport and Trafford. So that means we're missing a, a big audience. So that's another reason for... Um, stopping visits at Hurstwood Court to free up the officers so they can actually go out to schools. And we're actually looking at developing a whole range of information, so more videos, um, more interactive um, tools and equipment so we can actually go out to schools and do really interesting assemblies and classroom work rather than standing in front of them and talking to them, having something interactive. So, yeah. Make sure that, that we involve the local authority in that as well, because it's important they actually get out to schools as well and sharing the same messages. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know that lots of the local authorities do have officers that go into schools as well, so we need to be talking to each other to make sure we're saying the same things. But also we can share our resources once we've developed them so they can use them as well. But we also know that some councils don't have the officers to go into schools, so maybe they need more support from us as in having people to go into their schools. So yeah, it's definitely got to be, we work together on that. Okay, if that's us, questions done. If I can draw your attention to the recommendations, which are to note the progress against the plan, approve the ending of the current contract for the R4 GM bin app and development of a new app, 
and to approve the change use of Hurstwood Court site subject to agreeing of lease terms. Are all content with that? Yes. Get a nod? Yes. Brilliant. So we are moving on to item seven, which is asset management plan update, and that is Michael. Uh, this report just covers over our assets across the various facilities and sites. <coughs> so um, we set our categories out into A, Bs and Cs. A's being the operational waste facilities, B being land and buildings, and <coughs> excuse me, C being uh, closed landfill sites. It's quite a brief report. Just gives you an insight into some of the key areas. Uh, you may recall over the past couple of years we've been working on refurbishing the MBTs into MTRs at uh, Bredbury and Cobden. It's been a significant undertaking for my team over the past two years. And we've now concluded both sites at uh, Cobden and Bredbury. So Bredbury was delivered on a month ago this week, um, and Cobden was delivered in September last year. Both sites uh, are reporting good availability records and working quite well. We seem to have met all our targets on accessibility and maintenance and access. And the availability of the plant and the tonnages that go through the plant has increased which was our intention. Um, so overall, it's been a quite successful project. We did incur some delays at Bredbury over the Christmas period through January, which was due to um, some components of subcontractors, but they've been resolved now as snagging items. So the plants are handed over and, and currently fully operational. And we're still working with Suez on an operational basis to make sure that we, we look at the plants and review them on a regular basis and look at the data and make sure that we can optimize them going forward as well. So each plant uh, is capable, at, at Cobden is capable of, oh, sorry, Bredbury 120 tonnes, 1,000 tonnes a year, and Cobden is 100,000 tonnes per year. So there are two successful projects that we've delivered in Category A. Um, an example for the MTRs going forward on the capital programme as part of Appendix B is we're currently engaging with Suez to look at Longley Lane MTR on a similar basis to improve that plant and make it more accessible and more maintenance-free freeing up the, the oper operatives on site from heavy maintenance activities and slimming down the process on site and increasing the tonnage as well. Um, so if I bring you on to category B, which covers uh, land and buildings. So um, at Dunkirk Farm has been an ongoing item on the agendas for quite some time. It's a, a derelict uh, uh, farm buildings plot in Thameside. It's currently on offer for sale at the moment. That sale has been slightly delayed, it's a little bit protracted. Um, but we're still ongoing with the potential purchaser on that and we're hoping to conclude a sale over the coming months. And it will offload an asset and a risk from us in, within the portfolio. One other item I've mentioned and raised here is Hardy Lane at Charlton in Manchester. And the reason I've raised that is because it's a risk for us. So we have um, a pumped rising main, uh, which takes treated effluent from a closed landfill site at Barla Hall. And we've uh, experienced a collapsed drain on that site. And it's adjacent to the uh, Metrolink and to um, the bus lane depot on Hardy Lane. So I've been engaging with colleagues from TFGM and Manchester City Council just to how we approach that. So that's something I'm currently working on at the moment. Um, we're trying to resolve that with minimal impact to the bus lane and also to um, the Metrolink. So um, we have a, a plan and a scenario in place for that and I hope to have the action over the next two months. Uh, in terms of Category C assets, I just draw your attention to Waitlands. Um, this is a closed landfill site at Chichester Street. If you recall, uh, Justin's up there at Chichester Street. It's to the rear of Chichester Street where the works are going on at the moment. That site is currently built on landfill. And we have some uh, risk factors there with slope stability issues which have been ongoing for a couple of years. And we've invested some time and energy into site investigation works over the past couple of years which have come back satisfactorily satisfactory to us to say that there is a risk there but it's not an imminent risk so we're still monitoring that. Um, there's another risk on site where we are the riparian uh, owners of a culvert beneath the site and that means that this, the culvert passes beneath our land therefore we're responsible for its condition. So uh, we undertook a confined space entry um, a couple of months ago just prior to Christmas to undertake a full survey of the culvert and we actually managed to get 50 to 60 percent of it reviewed. There are some issues there within the culvert, some blockages of silt. So we're going to come back to that now and we have better weather conditions. So I'm hoping to report back to you on that sometime in May. There are some structural issues within the culvert that we need to pick up on that I'm slightly aware of, but once we get the full picture on the report for the whole uh, area of the culvert, and it's from A to B across the whole site, then I can report that back. But it is a, it is a risk for us and we're managing that risk by doing the culvert survey now. Um, 
The other section we have, which is covered in Part B, was to associate with the POS Landcare sites. You'll be aware that there's 18 closed landfill sites that we offset to POS Landcare in 2012, and they've provided us with an update report on their maintenance facilities and operations on site, and that's covered in Part B. Um, I have two appendices, and I'd like happy to take any questions if you wish as well. And Appendice B just gives you a bit of a picture of where we are over the three-year period, looking at what we've achieved last year looking at what we've got scheduled coming forward this year and then the year ahead as well, the following year. So, happy to take any questions. Any questions? Alan. Uh, I'm from this authority, I'm on the, uh, the Greater Manchester Green City Partnership, formerly the Low Carbon Hub, I'm, and Greater Manchester's got to find another 50% energy creation by 2050. I believe the government has now relaxed um, well, it's made things easier for uh, solar farm installation, the solar panels. So have, have we got any plans to in, increase the, our solar farm in, in Salford? Not specifically at Salford, but within GMCA, something that I'm involved in as well as part of my remit here is GMCA are looking to decarbonise the local economy and solar is a, is a big aspect of that. As we're a lead asset portfolio holder, we've been engaged with colleagues at GMCA to look at how we may adapt buildings and assets going forward, and that includes landfills. Um, so we are, you will be aware as well, previously, that we have a successful solar farm that's been delivered at Salford Road in Overholton. Um, I'm involved in the workshops within GMC at the moment, and we're looking to scope out where we could potentially put solar PV on the assets, so that we'll be looking at roofs of transfer loading stations, etc. So it is there, not specifically with us, but it is there in a the wider GMCA remit. Could you pop your microphone on? Is that right? There's no mention of the Brookhouse one on, on this site, and I understood the Brookhouse one was with them. And I raised this issue that we could we not be using some of those sites for solar energy? We think that is in part B, so... Is it? Sorry, the POS update is in part B, just because there's some sensitive items in there from POS perspective. Right, so can. I'm happy to, to answer that question in part B. Yep, thank you. Was there any more questions? If not, are we content to note that report? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so item eight is exclusion of the press and public and switching off the technology for us. So uh, if we just have a couple of moments while we do that.